What if I told you that we have the power inside of our own bodies to take bad memories, sad emotions, anger, anxiety, shame, and pressurize them into wisdom, creative projects, love, peace, repurposed energy to bring value to someone else. And even if the purpose is not necessarily to help others, if that is not your vibe, if you knew this practice could keep you on course to completing important tasks, kept you in your power, or completely revoked your power and energy from places, old scenarios, and people from your past that has changed the way that you view yourself, led you to a clearer understanding of the truth that we are not our thoughts. We are just the observer of these thoughts. We're the observer of these emotions. And because we are simply just the observers, we have the privilege and the opportunity to control how much of all of this we're bringing our attention to. I'm making a video today about the driving force of my creative process, emotional alchemy, honestly, with hopes that this awareness will make a durable engine. Instead of making our emotions our stop signs, we make them our speed bumps things that we have the authority to withstand and move forward from. Welcome to the Raw and a Half podcast where we get real and then some. I'm your host Jasmine Siri and every week I will speak on topics that align with reprogramming the subconscious mind. I share my experiences and discuss how I navigate life consciously so we can reach higher heights and deeper dimensions of the mind to reach our goals from a healed and open place together. So let's get started. Take notice of everything with discretion and curiosity. It's great to go out and be present and looking at the trees and the flowers and the bees and the flowing streams and all of the positive things that help us build and develop a mindful practice. But I find the most impactful change in some of my best work creatively as a writer, as a performer, my most powerful emotions used for alchemy lie under the blanket of suppression, the things that existed inside of my own emotional blind spot. The most challenging aspect about emotional alchemy as a practice and why very seldom people get far while doing it because most of us want the results of overcoming without really doing the hard work of targeting the things that we must overcome. I'm talking about the deep-rooted things inside. We completely underestimate that specific scenario's value and the ways that it's affecting us in our future. So we never really see the importance of doing the work to get through it and overcome. So we never really see the importance of working through it. Also, if you spend much time alone, like I have done, it's hard for you to find the dialogue to iron out all of these emotional things that you haven't really touched. The best I can give to anyone is talking to someone, allowing other people that have been observers of your life to bring things into consideration for you, like actually have someone that you value enough that way when they tell you about something that is pertaining to yourself, you actually take heed. Also, another form of advice that I can give someone that is just unsure of where to start, but they can feel that there's work that needs to be done. I would get really intentional about observing my emotions day to day by journaling. And with your raw authenticity that you only have the privilege of knowing because these are your words, allow your emotions to rise. And this is hard for some because we are automatically taught to suppress all of the emotions that for our caregivers were just too much to handle. And regulating our emotions are important, right? But it still doesn't mean that it's fixed. So when we give ourselves permission, it feels uneasy because we're finally giving ourselves an opportunity to feel things we probably never allowed ourselves to. But I want you to understand, in order to use the energy of these emotions, we have to acknowledge what these emotions are. For example, many of you have found my channel from the episode of Getting Over Your Fear of Being Seen. As a black woman, there were many ways that I had to come out of hiding, and surprisingly enough, it started by facing the ways that I, as a black woman, hid my hair. I went natural when the world went natural from 2014 to 2022, and I took so much pride in discovering how to make my scalp its most healthiest 
but texturism was still very present in my mind and in my day to day. And at the back of my mind, although my hair kinked instead of curled, I loved it for what it was. But I'll be honest and say I didn't entirely exist in a world where tight textures were the standard of beauty. So just imagine making every day an active protest just because you wanted to wake up as you. And I love the journey it led me on. I love the ways that I got to know myself and loved myself. But I was tired. After a while, entering my late 20s, the natural look on myself just wasn't something I identified with anymore. Until I made the decision to cut my hair, I was always in protective styles or buns as an attempt to hide that there just wasn't anything about my hair that I could appreciate anymore. This is off record, but can we be really honest about what protective styles are really doing to our scalp? Like, I mean, really. There comes a time where protection for so long just becomes neglect. Because I lived for a protective style, and I know that there is a population that still have thriving scalps because of their own dedication to a healthy maintenance practice, I think we all know which group I'm referring to because I used to be in it. Like, childcare. I'll say this. I'll use this correlation not to offend anyone. But you can protect your kids all day long, but if you're tying them up in the basement in the back, they aren't really thriving. And if anything, it's you that they need protection from, and that was me with my hair. I took care of it. It got what it needed, but I hid it because of whatever reason in my head or whatever experience in my path that made me feel like regardless of how healthy my hair was, it still wasn't great to look at you know I had a really good conversation with a woman that does my hair about how traction alopecia is rising because of wigs or tight braids buns etc and I said imagine a world where black women weren't applauded for hiding what we are or how we were made and it's like we went natural just to find different ways of going into hiding and I think it's just time to push the barrier just a little bit more. And I'm okay with standing alone in my opinion. It's just something interesting to acknowledge. It's something that I acknowledge within myself. And hopefully someone else can see it too. If not, hey, it is what it is. So by 2022, I just kind of got into a habit of covering my hair more and more. I think I just really like the idea of looking at my face without the distraction of hair outside of it. I saw hair as an identity. If you put on a specific hair, it made you something. And we all have these theories of when you wear your hair a certain way, you were treated a certain way. So I just wanted to be treated how I would be treated when people just saw my face. People just saw me. And that was just really what it was. And all of this was fine, in my opinion, until... One day, my partner asked me if I had converted to the nation of Islam without him knowing. And it was a joke, but he wanted to connect with me. He wanted to see all of me. And although I was able to be vulnerable and be open about a lot of things and talk about everything, there was obviously one part of me that I was hiding from him. But it wasn't just him. I was hiding it from the world. and I was also hiding it from myself. Until the very day, that same day, that I felt like it was a bombarding, but he just asked me to take off my covering. And at the time, it felt like he was asking me to rob a bank. I was so scared. I was so defensive. And it was something really so small. And I stand on a platform wanting people to accept me for who I am, wanting others to find acceptance for themselves. And here is a man with open arms willing to accept me, and I won't take this step off of the ledge because I fear the emotions that I have so long suppressed. Isn't it so interesting that when we allow these emotions to come up, it feels like we're showing up in the age where all of the damage kind of began? So at the time of this story, I was a fully grown woman. But in that specific moment in time, it felt like I was a nine-year-old girl. Remembering the first moment where someone made me aware how undesirable my truth was to the entire world. So, moving on, we sat on the floor, 
I talked about why I felt insecure about these ways and he just listened to me and he wanted me to take off my covering, take off my armor, which at the time was a bandana that I wore for several days between my next protective style. If you know, you know, it was like my hands were just tied from doing my braids. I just wanted to take a break, but my hair wasn't done. So I wore a bandana. If you know, you know. And upon taking off this covering, I just cried. You know, in my mind, I was showing this unlovable part of myself, expecting someone to just accept it. And funny enough, they just did. And it was just so interesting. It was an interesting form of surrender. And I'll never forget that moment in time. That was such an intimate moment. Um, it was a blind spot. I needed it. So I had to experience the acceptance, the radical acceptance without avoiding or trying to beat around the bush as to why I did X, Y, Z. I think it was just time. I was at an age where I just needed to be honest about why I did the things that I did, why I chose to hide myself, why I chose to suppress instead of just allowing myself to be fully accepted for who I am. The next thing is emotional inquiry. Luckily, I had someone there to help process those emotions with me. And even then, I wasn't able to get to the full depth in the presence of someone else. You know, I did that later on. But when I explored those, you know, origins of how those things came about, it was just all culture. It was all something in my community as a Southern black woman that... I needed, it was time for me to be my own person. It was time for me to exist in my own morals and not allow the things in my past to still have power over me. So I did what I had to do. It was just time to write a new story with this newfound awareness because I have this rule. Once I acknowledge it, once I see it, I have to find a way to let it go. So I was shown a blind spot. I was faced with the challenge of acknowledging it. I allowed my acknowledgement to be honest because when we pull things up, a lot of us tend to bully ourselves into believing that it has to be out of our system already. Like we have to pretend that with time, it's not as heavy as it used to be. And that could be a lie. And if it is still heavy, let it be, you know? If you're lying about how important it is to you as it's coming up, you're not really healing all of it. You know, sometimes time doesn't heal all wounds and that is welcome. Don't feel any types of ways about that. When I'm feeling anything, I do it because it is a power to have feelings. And it is also a power that I have to do something with the feelings. Because again, how can we take the time to alchemize the energy that we don't get to know? So I allow myself to feel everything. And at first I thought it was a curse. At first I thought that there was something wrong with me. At first I thought that I was lame. But it is because I feel these ways that I'm able to write the things that make other people feel too. And I will never, you know, take that for granted ever again. So I used the energy of shame and jumped into performative embarrassment almost. I just started to walk around my house with the freedom of like not having my hair covered. And that is like a painful thing as a woman, as a woman of color, like not wearing a hair wrap, not wearing anything. It, it, it was, I clung to these cloths and I thought it was for protection. I lied to myself saying it was protection, but really I was hiding a part of myself. So I just kind of release. And I started to care less and less about how God made me. And then when I started to care less, I started to see more clearly. And I saw the fullness of myself more closely. I saw myself regularly and I saw beauty and I saw God and I found a deeper love for myself. So if the natural journey was for me to love myself, I still had to get past the love the surface level love that people expect you to want to have. And then I got deeper into this real divine connection with myself and it was something that needed to happen. So upon, you know, accepting 
how I was for who I was. There were things that I liked and there were things that I didn't like. It was the truth that I felt that my natural hair made me look younger. I didn't want to continue the style. There were still some days where I still wore the bandana because my hair just wasn't done. I didn't feel like doing my braids. I didn't feel like flat ironing my hair. It didn't do much for me. I no longer identified with the way that I looked anymore. And if you're growing older, if you're older than me and you finally reach a point where you're like, you know what, I want to find my own personal style. This was the moment where I was like carving it out the woman that I wanted to be and how I wanted to walk forth into the world. And because of that, I was able to figure out a style that I liked. I researched the shape of my face and styled that looked good with the shape of my face and my stature. And I'm so happy that I did all of that, but I had to face it in order to do it, you know? And I know I'm just using this one scenario that very few can relate to, but it just shows honesty and discovery. And I think that's the most important part of this story, this journey. I know that my background may not be able to reach everyone, but for the people that I can reach, I will. You know, I would say, you know, don't go out there looking crazy because, you know, you got to come correct. We all got to come correct. But for the people who you feel like you're not allowed to have an intimate moment with yourself or you can't exist in an intimate space in your life because of how they respond to your authentic self or your truth. You have to do the work to accept yourself first because then you'll feel the weight of their lack of acceptance for you. I think there are so many people I allowed in my life that didn't really like me, didn't really care too much for me because secretly... I didn't care all that much about myself. So when someone mirrored back what I felt about myself, it didn't offend me. And once you do the small things, like just taking a good look in the mirror and realizing what's standing in your way of fully accepting yourself, you're seeing people so differently. I don't even like being in the presence of people that aren't able to see me or I get a glimpse of like, oh, naughty. I heard what they said about that specific thing, and because I identify with that, I don't know if I really want to share space with them. And that's hard to say because I like being open. I like to see all, but honestly, I don't like. I don't have to waste my time being around people that I just don't align with. You know, I am stiff as hell when it comes to me. I am, you know, because no one is worth going backwards for. All of these words, all of this work, all of the healing and understanding and the acceptance of myself, why would I take pedals backward just to have someone in my life that doesn't really understand me or value me or see me in all of the amazing ways that I see myself? And I think it's very important for me to say how important community is. You know, I wasn't able to get there, get to this awareness on my own. Sometimes the people that we love have the power to see us so clearly that because they want what's best for us, they leave doors open to help save us from ourselves. And we may be uncomfortable with the doors that they open. We may feel agitated with the gust of wind that's like knocking over all of our ish, you know, but they're has to be that type of friction in order to move forward. There have been many people in my life to do that for me because they loved me. And I hope with this video, I'm becoming that for you or whoever watches this video. Alchemy isn't magic. It's just science. You know, when I started using my voice and I started sharing my experiences and using my intuition to speak, you know, from my soul, people literally called me a witch. It was like, it was interesting, but... I just didn't understand people didn't get the concept of what I was doing. People thought it was just like taboo. I was just able to say the very thing that resonates or speaks on topics the way that I do because I am doing the emotional alchemy. Like all your, this entire channel is emotional alchemy. It's me expressing myself. And although people were surprised and shocked by that and although my ego loved sitting in that, I'm no different from you and I'm not magic or any different than anyone else. I just use the science of our connectedness to speak on things that remind us that we are all the same.
I'm also an extremely passionate person about a lot of different things. So the amount of passion that I have has to be carved out and steered into the right direction or else it's really dangerous. So I use it to write. Journaling saved my life. Speaking up healed me. And I continue to do it because I want people to understand that it's actually helpful. You know, it's something that could change your life if you decide to. I did it. It works. I feel better and you can too. I think the last thing that I want to say, we take for granted breathing. I think for a very long time, I was breathing wrong and I was having all of these short breaths and there was so much tightness and tension in my chest because I wasn't allowing, you know, one, because I was suppressing so many things and I was starting to get really tight. I hold a lot of tension in my neck and shoulders. So I was not really existing in my full self and allowing myself to feel the emotions. And two, I I just don't think it's taught in anywhere how to breathe, you know, in a way that's effective for your release. And I watched a video on how to breathe properly because I realized I couldn't hold my breath for long. I was sitting in a yoga class and everyone was doing deep inhales in And I would be like, why the heck is this teacher holding it for so long? But everyone had already developed a practice of breathing that they were just able to stay in flow. And I'm like, oh, okay. I need to practice being able to breathe. So in moments where I'm starting to suppress, I'm starting to take short breaths, I'm not allowing myself to release, I'm able to exhale out all of the energy that I'm feeling. And I know that might not necessarily be easy to do if you're not mindful enough to do it every single day but it does help breathing helps breathing is amazing and yeah i think that is all thank you all so much for making it to this far into the video do not forget to like comment and subscribe let me know how you feel about this episode you can also listen to these episodes on spotify and apple podcasts at the raw and a half podcast with jasmine siri you can follow me on instagram at jasmine.siri as well i would love to hear from you guys i hope you have a great rest of your day or night or wherever you're seeing this and i will see you guys in my next one